Just after midnight, on May 14, 1888, Fast Freight No. 31 left Pueblo, Colorado, headed north on the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railway. The train's locomotive, engine number 565, was pulling 13 cars into caboose. The rear six cars in caboose of number 31 never reached their destination that night. Instead, they became a runaway incendiary bomb. The resulting collision and explosion nearly leveled an entire town. The town in question was Fountain, Colorado, founded in 1859 around the same time as Denver. But whereas Denver was a mining town, Fountain was a railroad shipping center that relied on the railway to transport produce from its local ranches and farms. The 1880 census for Fountain shows a town of industrious people full of farmers, grocers, blacksmiths, shepherds, and merchants. Nearly all would be affected by the blast. The Santa Fe spent large sums to compensate the accident victims and their relatives for the loss of property and lives. One victim's relative, however, did not settle with the railroad and ended up in court. Mary E. Headland, the mother of Frank Shipman, a former brakeman who was found dead after the accident, filed a wrongful death suit that eventually reached the Colorado Supreme Court. In the end, the court ruled on Mary Headland's suit, but it never resolved the mysteries surrounding the fate of number 31. Strange and unsettling questions remain about what happened that night in May. There is evidence, never specifically discussed in the court's opinion in Atchison, Topeka and Santa Fe Railway Company versus Headland, that Frank Shipman did not die in the explosion but was murdered before the blast occurred. In fact, it could be that his murder prompted the blast. Walter Chubbuck was the train's conductor on the night of the ill-fated trip. As he made his rounds just prior to pulling out of the station at Pueblo, he discovered a young man named Frank Shipman on the front platform of his caboose. Shipman had a sad story to tell. He was 26 years old and disabled with an artificial foot and leg. He planned to travel to Greenland, a small town on the railroad line between Pueblo and Denver. His brother lived there, and he hoped to find work on a farm. Shipman did not have a ticket to ride the train. The number 31 carried freight, not passengers. In fact, the freight it carried that night was unusually hazardous. The cars at the rear of the train included a tank car filled with 3,000 gallons of highly flammable naphtha and a box car containing 18 tons of blasting powder. Chubbuck would have been perfectly within his rights to put Shipman off the train then and there, but the young man made a play for sympathy. Shipman asked Chubbuck whether he ever showed favors to crippled railroad men. Chubbuck told him that he sometimes did, but it depended on the circumstances. Shipman pulled out a letter confirming that he had been a brakeman on another railroad line. After examining the letter, Chubbuck responded that he could not transport Shipman based on it because it was too old. Chubbuck ordered Shipman off the train and left the caboose to fulfill other pre-departure duties. But Shipman did not get off the train. Instead, he remained on board as a stowaway. It was a move he would later have cause to regret. Differing accounts of the tragedy leave much of what followed shrouded in mystery. Any historian doing a piece of this type must deal with differing accounts that provide different people, places, and events. And we must simply go with the story that fits the facts as best as we can. It is clear, however, that once the train was underway, Chubbuck returned to the caboose where he found Shipman still on board. He did not have the heart to oust a crippled railroad man from the train to hobble along the track at night, so he let him stay. Chubbuck found other men on the caboose as well. There is a significant dispute about who these men actually were. The Colorado Supreme Court later identified them as a fireman seeking employment and two or three men traveling with stock on the train. 
The unemployed fireman remains a shadowy figure. Even his name is unknown. One of the stockmen, a man named Ira Fearson, later described the mysterious fireman as a heavy-set man with a pockmarked face. Fearson told officials of the Santa Fe that Chubbuck collected a dollar and fifty cents from the fireman in exchange for his passage on the train. Fearson and another stockman, A.C. Dodge, spent an uncomfortable few hours in the caboose. For it seemed that apparently Shipman and the fireman not only knew each other, but they also bore an old grudge that they were only too happy to renew. Shipman and the fireman exchanged words first, then came to blows. The stockmen did what they could to keep the two men separated until the train reached Colorado Springs. Once the train stopped, however, they had to leave the caboose to unload cattle. Shipman and the fireman were left alone in the caboose. At the time, they were still quarreling. Number 31 had stopped in Colorado Springs, where the Santa Fe tracks crossed those of the Denver, Texas, and Gulf Railroad. There was a rail yard at the crossing where Chebbuck and his men needed to switch some cars from the front of the train. They detached six of the cars in the caboose from the rear of number 31 and left them standing on the rails while they unloaded the stock cars from the front of the train into a stock chute on a stub track. Running south from Colorado Springs, the tracks ran downhill all the way to Pueblo. Chebbuck knew it was important to set brakes to keep the detached cars from rolling away by sheer force of gravity. The conductor set air brakes on two of the cars. He ordered the train's brakeman to set the others. The brakeman, noticing that the air brakes were not holding very well, also set hand brakes on several of the cars. Conductor Chubbuck and his men finished unloading the stock and switching the cars. The operation took approximately 30 minutes. Chubbuck then began backing up the train to reconnect the six detached cars in caboose. It was at this moment that the brakeman called out that the back end of the train was gone. At first, Chubbuck did not believe what he was hearing. He went down the darkened track to check. Sure enough, the six cars in caboose had completely disappeared. Chubbuck knew this could only mean disaster. The brakes on the cars somehow must have come loose. The cars were rolling downhill, and they would pick up speed all the way to Pueblo. Long before they reached that town, however, they would either jump the tracks or would collide with an oncoming train. Chubbuck ran to the Colorado Springs Depot to telegraph a warning to Fountain, the next stop, 12 miles down the line. The night operator was unable to reach Fountain. Chubbuck then fired up engine number 565 and sped down the train, hoping somehow to overtake the runaway cars. He had traveled only a couple miles south of Colorado Springs when he saw the sky illuminated by fire. He was too late. Earlier, at 1.30 a.m., passenger train number 7 had left Pueblo carrying 34 passengers. The number 7 had been traveling north on the same track that carried the cars hurtling south from the Colorado Springs yard. Ordinarily, there was no danger of collision because the number 31 freight would lay over on a side track in Colorado Springs, allowing number 7 to pass and proceed to Denver. But this was no ordinary night. At 2.41 a.m., the number 7 stopped in Fountain just north of the station to take on water. A short time later, its engineer heard a loud noise and saw a horrifying sight, the caboose and cars from number 31 heading straight for his train. They were flying south, unmanned, down the track. The engineer leapt from the train just before the two trains collided. The collision was catastrophic. It flung cars off the rails and blasted the passenger train backwards several yards. Worst of all, the car full of naphtha ruptured, dousing the ground and railroad platform with 3,000 gallons of flammable liquid. The naphtha quickly caught fire, leading to a hellish scene of a burning station and fiery train wreckage, the flames filling the night sky. Citizens of Fountain left their homes to peer at the disaster. Train crews, working frantically, managed to detach the passenger cars from number seven and to push them far down the track to safety. Their work was heroic. Although many of the passengers were injured, none died from the collision or the fire. The trainmen organized a bucket brigade, which the Fountain residents were quick to join. 
A courageous man named C.F. Smith, manager of a lumber company, climbed on top of the flaming depot and dumped buckets of water on its roof and walls. Even if those working to control the flaming nap that had succeeded, the fire was only one of the horrors that awaited the town of Fountain. There were still 18 tons of blasting powder to contend with. J.C. Denny, the Santa Fe's agent in Fountain, telegraphed Pueblo to find out if the car from number 31's wreckage marked powder really contained blasting powder. When informed that it did, he ran out of the depot yelling, Powder! Run for your lives! Mr. Denny's warning probably saved quite a few souls who fled the scene because just minutes after he gave them, the flames reached the powder car. As Lester L. Williams later described it in his account of the tragedy, the color of the flames changed from gold to silver. Then with a tremendous flash and a shattering, earth-shaking blast, it exploded. A great flame shot upward. For many miles, it could be seen coming up like a flash of a volcano fire. The blast hurtled shattered steel in all directions. C.F. Smith, who continued to work on the roof trying to put out the fire, was killed when a large piece of shrapnel caught him in the back, knocking him from the roof. Before he died, he assured the men who found him on the ground, Boys, I am not a coward, but doubtless they knew that already. At least two other people died from the blast. One of them a woman struck by a piece of iron that penetrated her skull while she stood 500 feet from the explosion site. Dozens of people were injured, some of them seriously. The blast left an enormous crater in the ground, demolished several buildings, and damaged nearly every other structure in town. Frank Shipman's crumpled body was found by the tracks, burned almost beyond recognition. With no known friends or relatives, he was hastily buried in a potter's field at Evergreen Cemetery. Later, relatives came and exhumed the body to take it to Greenland for burial. In the meantime, prior to the exhumation, a coroner's inquest had been held. The stockmen, Fearson and Dodge, had related their story at the inquest about Shipman's fight with the unnamed fireman. This drew the interest of railroad investigators who asked to examine Shipman's body before it was reburied. The examination revealed that Shipman's skull had been fractured by a blow that appeared to have resulted from a blunt impact rather than debris hurled by the explosion. The investigators developed a theory. They believed the unknown fireman in the caboose with Shipman had killed Shipman during their quarrel. Wishing to conceal the murder, he released the brakes on the six cars as they stood on the track, knowing they would roll downhill and be destroyed. The railroad hired detectives to track down the fireman, but they never found him. No one was ever prosecuted for Shipman's murder, if it was a murder. Shipman's mother sued the railroad, alleging negligence. A jury awarded her $3,500 on her claim that the railroad had assumed toward the deceased, Shipman, the duties and obligations due from a common carrier to a passenger. Mary Headland relied on a statute establishing a right of recovery for wrongful death when any person shall die from any injury resulting from or occasioned by the negligence, unskillfulness, or criminal intent of any officer, agent, servant, or employee whilst running, conducting, or managing any locomotive, car, or trainer cars, or a passenger died on the railroad from any injury resulting from or occasioned by any defect or insufficiency in any railroad or any part thereof in any locomotive or car. The railroad appealed. The Supreme Court ruled out a cause of action under the first part of the statute, holding that there was no evidence of negligence. The court stated, The uncontradicted evidence shows that the brakes upon the cars left upon the track were properly set, and it is conclusively shown that if the machinery of the road had been in good order and condition, the brakes would have been sufficient to have held the cars for many hours. Also, the railroad was not required to leave a brakeman in charge of the train because this was a freight train, not a passenger train. The second part of the statute posed more of a problem because there was some evidence of a defect, possibly in the brakes. Recall that the brakeman found that the brakes were not holding uh, the train very well. So the question became whether Frank Shipman was a passenger. 
The court held that Frank Shipman could not be considered a passenger of number 31. And this picture is of Justice Haight who rendered the court's decision. The court first took notice of the general division in the railroad business between freight and passenger traffic. Freight chains generally do not carry passengers. Even though they have a caboose where passengers can ride, because such vehicles are necessary for the accommodation of the employees of the company, they are typically used for this purpose only. Moreover, Chubbuck had specifically refused to carry Shipman on the train. The fact that Chubbuck did not eject Shipman from the train when he discovered his presence did not convert Shipman's status to that of a passenger. Chubbuck had merely taken pity on a disabled man. Both the stockman and the fireman who rode in the caboose had other reasons for being there. Their presence did not indicate that the railroad was engaged in passenger traffic on number 31. Finally, the court cited a long line of cases holding that persons present on freight trains generally are not considered passengers. The court concluded that because Shipman was not a passenger, the verdict in favor of his mother must be reversed. The Supreme Court's opinion provides a classic example of a court stating unnecessary background facts that implicitly bolster its result on a theory it did not adopt. The basis for the court's opinion that Shipman was not a passenger on the train did not depend on who released the air brakes or why. Nevertheless, the court alluded to the mysterious fireman's role in the tragedy. Its factual recitation ends with this intriguing language. What became of the fireman does not appear. He was not seen by any witness after the separation of cars at the crossing near Colorado Springs, and a diligent search failed to disclose any trace of him after that time. The theory of the defense was that in a moment of passion, he loosened the brakes and fled. It could be argued that the fireman's culpability for the disaster was at least tangentially relevant to the court's other conclusion, that the brakes were properly set and the railroad's employees therefore were not negligent under the first subsection of the statute. Given the jury's verdict in favor of Mrs. Headland, however, the court never drew the conclusion that the fireman had released the brakes and caused the tragedy. Instead, it just stated the facts and left the fireman's nefarious role within the realm of possibility. No one was ever prosecuted for the disaster, and that is how the story of the fountain train disaster ends.